Truly fascinating, if I should say. I suppose now's the time for the difficult questions. You mentioned someone named Samwell. Who is he, and why does he have the key to the crypt? Samwell is a defector from the cult of Vecna. They fancy calling themselves the Anointed. The key, on the other hand, well, you see, Samwell's a thief, much like yourself. One day, when he and the cult were exploring some ruins in the Shadowlands, he stumbled upon this golden puzzle key by chance. And where does Samwell hold allegiance now? Not to someone worse, I hope. The entire village holds faith in Ilmata, not like the cult tolerates it, but they let them be just to keep the peace, for as long as they get to collect their fifth, they can worship whoever they choose. I try to discern if Caiaphas is telling the truth. I try to discern if Caiaphas is telling the truth. You sense a hint of trepidation from your benefactor. Nothing apparent, but it's just slightly beneath the surface. But all he's been telling you so far has been forthright. So tell me, dear friend, why does your order want this goblet? What do you gain by acquiring it? That, my friend, I'm afraid, is something that I cannot disclose to you now. Come on. Stop wasting our time. I know you can do better than that. To put it plainly, our order would like to reshape a better world, a better future. Not just for Yosefre, but for the entire continent as a whole. And for that we would need the artifact if we would like our plan to come to fruition. Well met, but I'm not absolutely convinced. I myself am not fully privy to the plans, since we simply make it up as we go along. But to be concise, that is our utmost intention. You mentioned that the cult collects a fifth, is that right? The village must be doing well for that matter. Well, that's entirely a whole different story in itself. Residents of the village barely make ends meet, and the fifth is a way for the cultists to control the area. I know where you're heading with this dedent. I hope you don't get any silly ideas. I repeat, do not engage with the cultists. They are the least of your worries. Caiaphas, is it? May I ask, what perils do we expect in the Silver Mountains and inside the crypt itself? Knowing the Silver Peaks, it could greatly vary from frost giants to mountain trolls, even dragons. But from the information we've gathered so far, the part of the mountain you'll be traversing would be fairly safe this time of the year. It's what's inside the mountain that you should be worried about. And that's because? Well, the fact that the goblet, as compelling as it is, was lost in such a place tells you how dangerous it is. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a lich guarding it. A lich? You should have started with that from the beginning. I didn't want to discourage you. I hope you're not having second thoughts now, are you? Dear sir, may we offer you anything to eat or drink? You must already be weary from your journey and all our persistence. Glad you've mentioned it. I'll have some ale for now. Gratitude. But I seem to fancy myself some goose legs afterward. You need not fret about paying. Everything tonight is on me. The group drank and ate their fill while they still could as the journey to Farrowind village was to be completed in seven days by land, given its proximity. Caiaphas stayed on for another half hour to answer all the concerns of the group, after which he paid the party half of the price agreed and half upon completion of the quest, and then bid them safe travels. He replaced his pointy blue hood before leaving. The four stayed on a little longer to plan and review the particulars of the quest. What would you like to do? It's not in my character to traverse a mountain or cross a stinky gorge. 
I'll send a crow to my contact Helios Fintancaro to meet me in eight days by the fork in the road outside Farrowind. That bird's back better be good for all of us. I'll make several trips if I have to take you all. But I'm climbing no damn mountain. Ha ha ha. For me, I'll prepare my camping gear and stock up on several healing potions. And most importantly, the old Toby while relaxing by the campfire. I try to recall if I have some contacts in Farrowind Village that we can get hold of. I'll also pass by the apothecary to stock up on potions and buy rations from the shop nearby. When I reach home, I'll sharpen my holy great sword, then pray to Ilmata for guidance. I'll make sure that my backpack is equipped and has a sturdy long rope just in case. I'll also dust off my dwarven urgrosh of defending and make sure it's ready to cleave some skull. All of you head home to quietly retire in each of your dwellings for the rest of the night undisturbed. The next day, you all awaken eager and refreshed at God's wake. You have agreed to meet at the Eastern Gate to start your quest. You ready your steeds and ponies, for the days ahead will be spent on the road with neither inn nor tavern for the next hundred miles or so. A salty breeze fills your nostrils and slightly warms your skin. Groups of fishermen by the roadside wave at you when you pass them by. You spend the next two nights camping on a secluded part near the road, not too far out, but just enough to keep bandits out of sight. On the third day, the road slightly curves inland as the sea view is suddenly replaced by low-lying trees and hills. So, Amari, where did you say you've met Ferwin? After transferring to the Royal Guards, one of my first missions was from Lady Tears. We killed a couple of vampires up in Lagerfeld. Since then, she has always referred to me whenever she needed a paladin. Vampires can be a handful. What happened to Renholm, if I may ask? Renholm became my replacement in the Mage's Guard. An amusing fellow, that one. And yourself? What has been the Dragon Slayer up to these days? Oh, I'm surprised you're aware of that undertaking. Who wouldn't? Once we asked Renholm to recount the events of that quest, his stories were inconsistent. So Lady Tears filled us in on most of the details. Well, since you've asked, things have been pretty slow after the plague was lifted. There have been some contracts every now and then, but nothing serious so tavern hopping has been my recourse. Seems soothing. It has its perks. Seems those two are getting along well. So how has life been treating your old friend? You know, I have a wife now. Her name's Myrtle. Built her up. A home near Cobblebrook, by the Cloverwoods. About time you've soiled those mouldy oats of yours, Grandpa. Any kids? We're still saving up for that. The earnings from this quest will surely help. So the cleric life's fine and dandy, I suppose. You know, the usual. Church life can be mundane, especially when you're not traveling. You must enjoy looking up those women's skirts during service. You know the ladies? They always love an old, strong dwarf. <laughs> Finally, an hour past High Sun, you come across an inn. To your left, situated atop a small hill, 
not directly by the roadside. It's a worn down inn made out of wood, about nine by 12 meters. We can probably rest and spend the night here. My rump is killing me. What did I say? Signs of old age. <laughs> <laughs> a middle-aged portly woman greets you and beckons you to come in and rest. She has some black smudges of what seems to be charcoal on her face and sweat on her forehead. The place has accumulated quite some dust. Can I offer you something to drink or would you rather jump right into the main course? The lady asks you, a bit out of breath. You wouldn't happen to have any fire whiskey, would you? Nah, we only have ale. Shall I get you one? Fine, that will do. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. The lady leaves momentarily and returns with all your drinks after a short while. Surprisingly, she also brings you a plate of what seems to be old deer meat. The drink does not fare well to your taste buds, but you are tremendously thirsty. I spit the drink after taking my first sip. Hey, watch your manners, old man. Yeah, I know it tastes like piss water. It's all we have right now. Doesn't this venison look peculiar? Ma'am, how much will it cost us to stay the night? The lady doesn't look so pleased with the overall remarks. We only have a communal room. Eight silver per bunk. Fine, that will do. I take out eight gold coins and immediately hand them over to the lady. Oh, isn't this a little bit too much? I said silver, not gold. We'll pay for the entire room. We like our privacy. What does the lady look like? The woman catches you gazing at her. She stands a little below five feet and has an auburn curly hair, round face and stubby arms. But her legs are that of highborn stock. Olga! She calls out to someone from the back. I have my daughter here if you would like some company for the evening. <laughs> 